Kerry. Thank you, my lady. Um, I think, uh, Professor Gould, I'm turning to you next, and questions in relation to educating the workforce about infection prevention and control, and they are in Chapter 10 of the report for uh, those who are following in the paper copy. Can I ask you, um, firstly, about nurses? Do they um, cover IPC training during their degree or any of the practical stages of their learning? They do. It's stip they, in the nursing and midwifery uh, regulations that cover basic nurse education, pre-registration nursing education, it has, infection prevention has to be covered, um, and then they get practical experience of it in the clinical areas. So they will get classroom practice, but what they will get in the practice areas depends quite a lot on where they go. Quite. I think you said in your report that the uh, NMC, the regulator curriculum, does not provide specific details of what aspects of IPC should be included or when or how. Is that correct? That's correct. And so with your experience, can I ask you, how does that play out when you're trying to teach uh, the nurses? With difficulty, because you never know who's been exposed to what, and very often what people have seen in the, in the clinical placements isn't reflected in what the university teaches. Do you think there should be an attempt by the regulator to standardise what IPC is taught and how? A degree of standardisation would be helpful yeah. because then you would know that the basics had been covered. And the basics in terms of the COVID pandemic, what would you have in mind for a respiratory uh, virus on the next time there's a, a pandemic? The basics for any infection prevention and, and control teaching that anybody would have, whether related to respiratory infection or anything else, would be you would have to teach people about the chain of infection. Yeah. So you would need to teach them where the infection comes from, where the reservoir of it is, whether it's other people or the environment, um, how it escapes from that, in, from that source, how it's spread, how it gets into the next host and the damage it does there. Because if you know the chain of infection, you know how it can be broken by hand hygiene, by wearing PPE, by a combination of things. Do you know why there isn't a degree of standardisation or reference to this in the NMC curriculum? I don't. OK. All right. Uh, healthcare assistants, can I ask you about any training that they receive in relation to IPC? It would very much depend on where they were. It would depend on the organisation for which they worked. It would depend on the enthusiasm of the local infection prevention teams and the other people they come into contact with. And it would depend quite a lot on how motivated they were. Some can be very interested and know a lot, others much less. Do you think there is a need for any degree of a standard, standard training in relation to healthcare assistance? Yes, it would be useful. And would that be a matter for their regulator? They don't. Mm, unqualified they're not regulated. Staff are not regulated. No, I, I was just not, trying to not, think. Not in this country. Some other countries, but not in the UK. So, can I, can I just ask before we go further mm. down this line, was there any effect, causal effect, in the pandemic as a result of this lack of standardisation or regulation? Because you know, this is all about the impact of the pandemic. So I just think we need to be careful about what in a perfect world the training would consist yeah. of and whether there was a causal effect because there wasn't standardisation of training. I think if you inform people, if you inform people properly, you can allay their fears. So if people had had some knowledge and had known about where to go and get it, that would have been helpful. Thank you. Um, I think you say there have been... Um, arrangements for IPC education and training have been updated since the pandemic and you set those out in your report. Indeed, they're different in all four nations of the UK, but I, I don't need to ask you about that. Can I ask you about the non-clinical staff and any education and training that they receive, porters, cleaners and the like? Are you aware of any IPC training for them? When somebody moves to a new employer, when somebody begins to work in healthcare, first of all, they have to have induction training. And that is the same for all staff, whether they're qualified or unqualified. So what they make of it would depend on, on the way that it's put across um, and, and on how, how relevant it's made to be. Okay. Um, can I turn to a different topic? please. And could I have up on screen INQ 502072? It's the timeline of some of the changes 
to the IPC guidance. I make it clear it's not every change to the IPC guidance. Um, Dr. Shin, can I ask you just very briefly about high consequence infectious diseases? It's at chapter six in your report, but given that you are on the ACDP, maybe you don't need to turn up the, the pages. There are specific rules, as we understand it, that pertain to HCIDs. Is that correct? That's correct. And we know it was classified in January and then declassified on the 19th of March 2020. Yes. Is this right? The rules include FFP3 to be worn, and indeed I think there's a whole kit of um, PPE. Yes. And there is there are only a small number of HCID units uh, across the UK. There are a, a few specialised units, and there are some, if I can call it, less specialised units. But partly due to the pandemic, the number of uh, HCID units in total has increased. But the Two units of high, I think referred to as high security units, are at Royal Free, which has been there for quite a long time, and I think now Liverpool. Uh, there are some other units which can handle uh, airborne HCIDs, for example, St Thomas is one example. Uh, so they can handle very uh, severely ill uh, respiratory virus cases, for example, if there was a MERS uh, coronavirus. So there's a network across the UK. Were you part of the ACDP when the decision was taken to declassify HCIDs? Uh, I was not on that in that meeting. All right, but are you aware of the reasons why it was declassified? Uh, in broad terms. All right, and can you just outline that to us in broad terms, please? So my understanding of it is that it, it was a decision not not indicating that was there was a change in the severity of the uh, infection, but it's more linked to the fact that basically HCID's framework is there to, for us to handle unusual imported cases. For example, a suspected Ebola or suspected Lassa fever or even flu, etc. For small numbers of sporadic cases, quite clearly from by March and April 2020, uh, we were facing a large pandemic and very large scale infection, which was not, which was not what the HCID network was designed for. So it was not the right uh, approach uh, to the situation as it was evolving at that time. And I think you say later on in your report that, from your perspective, um, initially classifying COVID as an HCID was an example of the precautionary principle in practice. Do you, do you agree with that? Uh, very much so. The HCID precautions are very stringent. Uh, and it's basically, when we say something's an HCID, or we suspect a patient of having it, it's basically uh, like a red alert to tell everyone, this patient, this case, needs extraordinary response. Can I ask you this, please? Once COVID was declassified, was there anything to do with the declassification? Did the declassification decision have anything to do or prevent the IPC guidance recommending FFP3? I don't think I have enough knowledge to answer that question. Right, fine. Accurately. If we look at... Um, the timeline, clearly 10th of January there, there's the HCID uh, precautions. 13th of March, so just before it was declassified, there was some guidance that recommended um, airborne precautions in hotspots where AGPs are being conducted, and then FRSMs for routine care, and then COVID was declassified. I think in your report, uh, you make the point that at the time the decision was taken, to declassify it as an HCID, it was possible to separate that decision from the need to retain enhanced PPE if considered appropriate. I'm reading from your paragraph 6.9, if that helps. I think the question of what happened with the PPE is, you know, is a difficult one, which is probably the entirety of this, set, this module, perhaps. Um, and its exact decision-making for that was um, I'm not that privy to. All right, fine. Thank you very much. May I turn? I can take that uh, timeline down. Thank you very much. May I turn to another topic, though, that you did deal with in the report, and that of visiting guidance. Um, clearly, it's a, a difficult decision. But can you just help? Um, do I understand it correctly that even outside of the pandemic, there have been visiting restrictions imposed in relation to other viruses? Um, help us with that, please. Just give us some examples. 
So, for example, the most obvious example of when visiting is restricted uh, would be during an outbreak, for example, the flu or norovirus, uh, even measles and other infections. So, in that case, restrictions are brought in to protect anyone entering that ward, which include visitors and members of the public, who could then be put at risk, and we try to avoid that as much as possible. So, they could be solely to prevent visitors coming to a specific ward. Have you known them to prevent people coming to the hospital in its entirety? Not in my working okay. life. All right. Um, we know, however, there were visiting restrictions preventing visitors, say, for three at the beginning, uh, exceptional circumstances, end of life care, when the woman was in labour, and I think a parent accompanying a child or a, a baby that was requiring treatment. Um, can I ask you about that decision? It obviously has caused a, a great deal of, of upset. Thinking yes, and we, I think we, everyone working the NHS understands the reasons why that's caused so much controversy and upset. But the decision making to restrict visiting in that manner and to only allow those specific circumstances, especially end of life care and uh, pediatric uh, neonates, newborn babies and in labour, that was done to really to protect members of the public and visitors. So a balance had to be struck somewhere and the, the, where the balance lay was in those particular circumstances, excuse me, <coughs> It was thought that the, the, the risks of infection were outweighed by the benefits of having, you know, allowing the family, for example, to be there when a patient end of life. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that is a very major life event, obviously, uh, and, and the other examples. So that was where the line was drawn. Yeah. But I think some form of control was reasonable, logical, and I think the right, probably the right decision. We were facing, as we keep saying, we were, we're facing this new, rapidly rising uh, infection with high mortality we've seen and you know a very dangerous uh, foe so to take stringent measures at the beginning uh, was the, I think in re reflection a reasonable step to take um, there may be a distinction drawn by many between a visitor and a carer carers providing help to feed the patient, communicate with the patient? Do you think perhaps there should have been um, more acknowledgement in the exceptions to the visiting restrictions to let carers uh, attend on their loved one? I think they could have been. So especially if the carer was somebody who was already living right. with the, the, the patient, mm -hmm. coming with COVID, for example, they already had the same exposures and risks already. So I think that is reasonable to say that a carer in that situation could be allowed in, and I'm sure lessons will be learnt uh, about that scenario. It was my fault because it was a bad question, because I, I actually wanted to ask you whether the carer should be let in, whether they're a loved one or someone who comes in and routinely provides care for. Oh. Do, would you draw a distinction if they're providing care and they know the, the patient well? So, late, maybe perhaps later in the pandemic, are we, forgive my, my hospital's example, we have, a, you know, like many other trusts, have an elderly care with a lot of dementia patients. And in that setting, we have been quite uh, flexible in allowing carers and uh, relatives to, to come and see those patients with dementia, for example, because that helps reduce confusion, disorientation, distress, etc. I don't know if that's an adequate answer to your question. Well, I suppose really it was whether, in the event of another pandemic, we widen the exceptions to the visiting restrictions to allow carers to come in for people with dementia, for example, or those with learning disabilities, uh, and take a slightly more um, purposive approach and be less restrictive. Do, do you mean carers who are not family members? For yes. I see. I think that you could, you could argue that, because if they're seeing patients, say, daily, mm. and they've got the same exposure anyway, um, I think that's something that could be looked into. Yeah. Um, can I take it that you do not consider it uh, reasonable to have patients wearing FFP3? I think given all the difficulties we've discussed about FFP3, uh, logistics and provision to healthcare workers, testing, uh, mask types and all of those challenges, I think that's one good argument against that. In addition, we've also mentioned the discomfort of wearing FFP3 masks. So it's, 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 I think FP, the respirators should be used when they are absolutely necessary. And for visitors, for short-term visitors or for patients who are already unwell, et cetera, I think an, F, if, an FRSM would be a reasonable uh, measure in that case. And even FRSMs, even though they're not tight-fitting, et cetera, 
to wear one for, say, 24 hours, apart from your eating and drinking, it's also quite uncomfortable. So, you know, we always try and take steps to reduce discomfort in our patients. I think you looked in uh, to the impact that a range of interventions had on the first wave, and there was a study conducted uh, that concluded that sustained visiting restrictions were, le were likely to have reduced nosocomial transmission, but its implementation, implementation was likely of less impact than other IPC measures, such as universal mask wearing and isolation of infected healthcare workers. So was that potentially a study that supported the implementation of visiting restrictions? I would say so, but it also illustrates the fact that with IPC, it requires the application of multiple measures. Um, and we also, just to give another example before the pandemic, a number of trusts use visitor restrictions for neonatal intensive care units because if they bring siblings in who often have other respiratory viruses, that poses a risk to the babies in that unit. So that's another, exa another pre pandemic example where some form of visitor restriction was applied. Okay. Um, can, I, it might be a question for you, Dr. Warren, but thinking about the uh, patient on the ward in an end-of-life situation where visiting restrictions were either severely limited or we have heard examples where there were no visitors allowed, C can you help from your experience how the staff communicated to the families of the loved ones of the dying patient? So I worked in a department where it was the job of the doctors every afternoon to update relatives who weren't able to visit the ward. Um, and that formed up a significant proportion of their working day. I think it was one of the most difficult aspects for doctors working in that environment during the pandemic. Um, this is something we just do not normally do. We usually would update people, relatives who've had the opportunity to see their loved ones in a ward setting and be able to update them in person. Doing it by telephone was an incredibly impersonal experience for many people and I think quite distressing for junior doctors and other healthcare workers. Mm. And. Uh, finally, this I'm asked to ask about a slightly different scenario where there is a cultural importance among a number of communities, in particular among black, Asian and minority ethnic communities who rely on social networks for healing and whether there should be a relaxation, I suppose, on the visiting restrictions to allow members of those communities to visit. Do any of you have experience of uh, trying to deal with people from those communities being prohibited from coming in and seeing their loved ones. Do you think we should expand uh, the numbers of visitors to try and incorporate communities like that that have that cultural importance? I don't think I have any direct experience, particularly based on ethnicity. I think we haven't talked about ways that we could make that experience safer apart from the use of FFP3 masks. So. In, ideally, we would, for example, have people in end of life in side rooms, away from other patients, away from other uh, potential sources of infection, which might make it safer for the visitors coming to the hospital. Um, and there are potentially other ways that we could do that to make that experience safer for the visitors, as well as staff and other patients. Um, but I've not seen any systematic studies by which that's been um, studied and which we could provide evidence for today. I think also that's it's an extraordinarily difficult territory to work out how you would say a particular group because, I mean, in Northern Ireland, I was told that, you know, a great deal of importance is placed um, uh, for end-of-life care and, and death and funeral rights. And that. I mean, I'm not sure I can go down that path. No, um, it, there may be lots of people wanting exceptions to the visiting restrictions, and I suspect that reality comes is where's the line drawn? It was drawn in this pandemic with end-of-life care Return, women in labour and babies and uh, children being. And the question is really, is, is the line drawn there or slightly differently in the next time? Yes, Dr Shin. I think this will be really difficult because, you know, if you had a, yeah. a bay of four, let's say a four-bedded bay, a COVID bay, and you could, you'd say to one set of relatives, mm -hmm. you can come in because you're from a certain background, mm -hmm. and then the patient opposite can't. Exactly. That would be extremely inequitable and difficult to implement and difficult to defend, I think. Yeah. Understood. Um, we mentioned there other IPC measures, and so can I ask uh, you about this, Dr Shin? It's in Section 9 of your uh, report, and you deal there with a number of measures that now we're quite familiar with in the inquiry. I'll deal with testing separately, if I may, but I think you said that... Um, Clearly, there's a variety of interventions that were taken to try and reduce uh, 
uh, transmission of COVID, but there is variation in the breadth and quality of the evidence underlying these measures. Can you help us with what you are meaning there? I, mean, I think there are certain measures like, for example, social distancing, uh, which I think probably were quite effective, but getting the evidence for that in a real-world setting uh, is difficult. Um, although you said testing would have to be managed, uh, handled separately, that was a very important um, IPC strategy to, to use, utilize testing and surveillance testing of asymptomatic patients uh, and staff uh, was a really Im important uh, revolution when it, when it arrived. Yeah. Um, there was, I think, as you set out at paragraph 9.2, that whatever the individual contribution, it's likely a combination of approaches were effective in re reducing transmission. Is it right that uh, UXA did a modelling study that concluded that the combination of interventions used to reduce nosocomial transmission between March 2020 and July 2022 averted 400,000 infections in patients and 410,000 infections in healthcare workers? Um, based on that study, did you therefore conclude it's likely that the combination will be needed again in the event of a, a future pandemic? Is that to me? Yeah. Or either of you? Uh, yes. I think it's highly likely you will need a combination of different measures. Um, the study points out it's, it's quite difficult to, put, to pick, pull out the relative contribution of each measure, and it's important because they were often introduced together. So it's highly likely we will need a wide range of interventions again in any future pandemic. Um, one of the measures uh, we spoke of there was the social distancing, and I'd like to ask about the practicalities of that in the hospital. What about in staff-only areas? Um, how easy or otherwise is it to have social distancing in staff-only areas? So I, I did uh, work on uh, groups which dealt with this, and I think... It, it was quite feasible. Um, so, as, as you know, during lockdown, many, many of the non-clinical staff worked from home, and that was, technology allowed that to happen quite efficiently. And when we started having staff come return to the office, we just worked out what was the staffing density which would comply with social distancing requirements. Um, and we worked out, you know, staff groups had rotors saying, you come in on these days, and in the end, we'd make sure we didn't exceed that, that number which would uh, go, breach social distancing. In addition, for example, most meetings, which were previously all face-to-face, -face, like, like this, uh, we moved very quickly to online meetings. And so again, technology helped with that measure. So if we're non-clinical areas, I think uh, social distancing was actually quite achievable. And presumably used up areas in the hospital estate that might have been given over for lecture theatres, th th that kind of um, arrangement. Um, Protecting clinically vulnerable staff, um, I think it's right that you say that if they were, if the staff were on the shielded patient list, then clearly they had to stay at home. Um, what about those staff who weren't on the shielded patient list but were otherwise had uh, vulnerabilities, either are clinically vulnerable or had other comorbidities? What was the position in relation to them? Shall I take that? So. In that intermediate sort of group, if I can call it that, mm. um, some of the measures used were, for example, uh, deploying them to non-COVID wards. So as, as we've discussed, uh, we would have COVID wards and non-COVID and acute areas and non-acute pathways. And for those high-risk staff, uh, they would be deployed to um, either wards which are um, areas where staff and patients were well screened and with no, expe no expected COVID patients and or, for example, outpatients. And would uh, the staff who are sort of vulnerable but not on the shielding pa shielded patient list, would they be risk assessed to work out the safest place in the hospital, or the least unsafe place in the hospital that they could go? Yes, we were, in, we were basically told uh, to do risk assessments for, I think, all staff, actually. Um, but that was a very big exercise uh, with, run by Occupational Health mm. and others to risk assess, I think it was all staff, um, and that helped decide where it was safe or not safe for them to work. You said in the report, certainly, that those with other risk factors, such as male gender, older age, as we've looked at, being of black, Asian, minority ethnic background, with chronic diseases like diabetes, asthma, it was potentially quite a large cohort of vulnerable people that had to be risk assessed. And I didn't ask, how long does it take to be risk assessed? So if I give an example of my own trust, we, we had a, a pro forma, which I think was probably uh, shared 
uh, at least regionally, and that needed um, probably a meeting of some kind between the line manager and the member of staff to go through. If anything was un uncertain or complicated, that would go to occupational health. But it was basically a tick box reformer leading to, uh, I think it was a score, uh, and then OH, because the OH team is quite small, and there's no way, we have more than 11,000 staff, so our small OH team can't do that. So it was, it was devolved to local management right. to do that. And uh, I think you make the point that the rollout of the vaccines uh, in early 2021 reduced the risk to a, a number of NHS staff, including clinically vulnerable. Um, and that coupled with adjustments, the risk assessments, redeployment areas was a, a measure that was included to try and help keep uh, them safe from COVID. Um, can I ask about the impact on occupational health? We haven't... Uh, considered that yet within the inquiry. Just help us, how big a team is an occupational health team? Uh, that varies a lot, and during the pandemic, our occupational health department had a lot of high staff turnover. Right. Um, considering the size of my trust and my experience in other, working in other trusts, occupational health teams tend to be relatively, quite, relatively small, surprisingly small, and they, and they have, as I said, a lot of high staff turnover, especially if I give a specific example of medical staff, I find the turnover there very, very high, and often they're part-time as well. So I think for many trusts, they would struggle to provide adequate OH coverage in normal times. Okay. And we've quoted, I think, one paper which we found where one of the occupational health doctors or team of them said their workload increased 20-fold during the pandemic. How they cope with that, I don't know. Okay. Um, I won't go through all of the other ways that attendance was reduced in hospitals. Some of them think are obvious, like the use of remote, remote appointments, working from home. Can I ask about blue and green pathways? Um, I think some might be red and green, depending yeah. on which um, nation or indeed which region we're talking about. But was the idea to keep non-COVID patients away from COVID patients? Um, how easy in practice, though, was that to bring into effect? Uh, so, as you said, the nomenclature changes, so they have different colour codes, for example. But basically, it's about separating acute patients, acutely ill patients, from elective patients coming for surgery, for example, or uh, diagnostic radiology scans, that kind of thing. I, in many hospitals, as we said, I think many hospitals have multiple sites, so that starts to make it become feasible, and that's what we did. So, our main site, which had an emergency department, was clearly probably not suitable or ideal for an elective pathway, and we moved some of them to other sites which didn't have an emergency department. And so I think each trust will be very different, and the, yeah. I'm sure the experience across the UK vary, but the principle was to try and separate acutely unwell patients, especially COVID patients, from the well elective patients. Yes. Um, and so if uh, once there was a reinstatement of elective uh, surgery and treatment, I think you said there a negative PCR was required two days before the planned elective procedure. Uh, and if obviously negative, the procedure could go ahead. But um, and if positive, the Postpone. treatment cancelled or the surgery cancelled. Postponed. Yeah. Postponed. Thank you. Um, clearly, though, within the two days, one could be negative on the day to take the test, but catch COVID then the next day. How was that managed, if at all, for those coming back for an elective procedure? That's a very difficult eventuality, which we did see, uh, and that was hard to, to manage. If I remember correctly, we actually even we also had, for some patients, a rapid PCR on the day of the procedure, literally hours before the procedure, because we were able to, once testing was scaled up, as Dr. Warren mentioned, the importance of scaling up testing, when we had sufficient rapid testing capability, patients might even come in, say, two, three, four hours before the procedure to get a final PCR, and that's green, uh, negative, then they can put, go ahead. and that. Although that gave some reassurance, it was also, I'm sure, really stressful for the patient. Yeah. Um, but as you said, and we've described, the incubation period being quite long, there's no guarantee that they would then not subsequently develop COVID. And we were aware of that. But all we wanted to show is that on the day of the procedure, that they didn't have detectable COVID at that time. And I think you make the point in your report that uh, the rollout of the rapid testing in particular gave reassurance to immunocompromised patients who are obviously worried about coming to hospital and contracting COVID. I suppose that really brings us on to testing, and I suspect turning to you, uh, Dr. Warren, there's various 
I think, basics we may need to cover. Can I start, please, with a summary of the differences between PCR tests and lateral flow devices? If it helps you, it's 9.3 in the report. So these are two different ways of, of testing for, for COVID. So normally a, a nose and throat swab uh, for both methods. The PCR test is a sort of molecular test. We're looking for the specific uh, RNA, the specific uh, part of the virus, which is very accurate. So we're looking um, specifically for, for COVID, and it's got a high sensitivity. So we're picking up a large amount of the, the true positives. Lateral flow tests, which we all know and love, have a similar principle to a pregnancy test. You can take them at home. They're much easier, faster to get a result, but they're less accurate. So while they're useful for screening for certain purposes, they have probably less utility as a, as a diagnostic test in hospital. And can we just be clear about the use of the term sensitive here? What does it um, mean in the way that you're using it? So of all the people who genuinely have COVID, what proportion of those patients will it detect? Right. So for PCR, we'll be picking up over 95% potentially if the swab is taken properly. For lateral flow tests, there's a much wider quoted range, so from 40% up to 90 plus percent. So there are pros and cons to each, if I may push it like that. Yes, so the PCR test, depending on how you do it, if it's being done in a main laboratory, you might get the result 24 hours later. As newer rapid diagnostic testing platforms came on later in the pandemic, you might get the result in within an hour. The lateral flow test is very quick, but less accurate. Um, clearly, testing played a role initially in the pandemic to confirm that the patient had, in fact, got COVID, because I think you make the point in the report that a number of the symptoms alone, coughing, sneezing, feeling unwell, are uh, capable of being any number of different diseases or viruses. Um, turnaround times, can you help us with, once the rapid COVID test came in, what was the, the turnaround time for those tests? So potentially less than an hour from the point that the test has been done. And I think you say in the report, easy to use, and they could be deployed to areas in the hospital near the patient. Exactly right. And then if a patient came in for um, a procedure, had a rapid test and tested positive, were they literally sent home? If they were otherwise well, then yes. yes. Then to follow national guidance on self-isolation, etc. And then cleaning of the areas where they'd been and the like. Understood. All right. Um, Can I ask you about testing uh, of healthcare workers? And I think there was testing, uh, uh, but you say in your report at paragraph 9.25, uh, routine symptomatic testing or asymptomatic screening for respiratory virus infections in healthcare workers was not performed in the UK prior to the pandemic. Is that correct? Yes. So once testing came in, it was new to healthcare workers as much as it was to the rest of us? Uh, in the sense that you know, you're testing people who don't otherwise need to come into yeah. hospital. Absolutely. All right. um, you make the point that during a March and April 2020, there was a large increase in PCR testing for COVID across the UK. And then we know there are various dates when different people were tested, including differences between symptomatic and asymptomatic. Um, I think you said in the report that for asymptomatic, there was a pilot of testing in March to May 2020. Can you help with that? So a number of trusts recognised early on the importance of asymptomatic screening for healthcare workers or diagnostic testing. So firstly, they recognised that some of our healthcare workers would be asymptomatically carrying and potentially transmitting the infection to vulnerable patients, other healthcare workers. They also recognised that following government advice to self-isolate, if you had any of these symptoms, that a large proportion of those would not have COVID, they would have one of the other conditions, and you were potentially losing a large amount of your workforce who did not have COVID. So therefore, the importance of distinguishing those that did and did not have COVID was really important to ensure that you were isolating the right healthcare workers and the others could return to work. Yeah. Um, I but that wasn't widely available. It was piloted in a small number of trusts, particularly those who had more testing capacity, potentially more academic um, uh, laboratories to help to support testing capacity. Do you know, was that rolled out, uh, even though it was a small pilot, was it UK-wide or is this in England only? Can you help? 
Um, I'm, I'm aware of a number of pilots that were conducted in England. I'm not sure about the, other, the rest of the UK. Um, when lateral flow tests were uh, much more widely available later in the pandemic, and they were, they were rolled out to everybody, all healthcare workers, that's across the four nations, implemented in slightly different ways. And you make reference in your paragraph 9.26, Doctor, to a modelling study that has shown that periodic testing of healthcare workers has a small effect on the number of hospital-acquired COVID-19 cases in patients, but reduces infection in healthcare workers by as much as 37%, um, and which results, is, as you say, in only a small proportion of staff absences. Just help us put that into the real world. We might come to this in a moment, but the majority of patient hospital-acquired infections were acquired from other patients right. during the pandemic. Whereas with healthcare workers, there was a lot of healthcare worker to healthcare worker transmission. So by understanding who is asymptomatically infected in your healthcare workers and isolating them effectively, you reduce that healthcare worker to healthcare worker transmission right. and therefore um, help to prevent okay. healthcare worker infections. Um, I think in your report, as we've looked at potential pros and cons, if I can call it that, between lateral flow devices and PCR tests, um, you say there's been no uh, comparison made between the testing approaches, and therefore their relative contribution and indeed cost as an IPC measure remains poorly studied. Um, why is it important for there to be a comparison between testing, uh, testing approaches? They have big cost implications, that each of them has different advantages and disadvantages depending on how you use them. Um, and there are a number of different uh, commercially available tests or tests available in any kind of way. Um, so making direct comparisons between lateral flow tests, of which there are many, many brands, and PCR tests, of which there are many different approaches, is very difficult to do. Um, also, the frequency, so how often you're testing. If you're testing once a week, you, know, you have an entire week which develops symptoms you might get missed. Doing it every day or even multiple times a day is perhaps impractical for a variety of yeah. reasons. So to understand this to the best that we can for any future pandemic, we probably need to do more work. And as technology advances and new diagnostics are available, they too will need to be appraised in any future pandemic. And this is an area of great and quite rapid scientific development. Right. It brings me on to transmission of COVID in hospitals and your chapter... 11, please. Um, I think you make the point at the outset that there's a focus on the transmission of COVID within hospitals, obviously because we want to keep people safe in hospitals, but um, I think some of the data that we're going to look at is only available in hospitals, or the majority of it is only available in hospitals. Why is that? There's a number of different reasons. Um, so firstly, for hospitals, we have data, high quality data, on where a patient is at any one time, or indeed a healthcare worker. And they are essentially um, in your hospital for a long period of time. You have their test results that you can link that information to. Um, you have a large amount of information about those individuals and therefore can study them and how they transmit within the hospital. That's much less easy to do in primary care, where the patients are there only very short periods of time, um, or in social care, where perhaps you don't collect that information or can tie it to their test results in the same way. Understood. I would say there's a historic bias towards infection control studies in secondary care in hospitals, and the primary care, social care, are much less well studied and published on. Um, you make the point that healthcare-associated transmission was a feature of hospitalised cases for SARS, I think, and MERS. What about flu? The evidence base for flu is, is much smaller. There was a, um, an increasing evidence base that hospital transmission of flu was important. Um, and we have um, data from our own trust and from other hospitals in the UK from the years prior to the pandemic, which showed that flu is probably an underappreciated hospital-associated infection. Okay. The quoted but numbers are very variable depending on the type of hospital. But it, it's not new that people go into hospital and nonetheless contract a virus. No, or indeed another hospital-associated infection. Yeah, all right. In relation to COVID, I think you said that the first study on COVID-19 was published from Wuhan in February 2020. Is that correct? And it stated that 41% of all cases 
identified in patients and healthcare workers were hospital acquired infections. So early on in the pandemic, we were aware that there was the possibility of COVID transmitting in this way. Can I ask you about your paragraph 11.3 though? And can you just set out for us why it is challenging to work out the location where SARS or COVID is uh, acquired? The main reason relates to the incubation period, which we talked about right at the start of today's hearing. So the time from somebody catching COVID and then to developing symptoms ranges from two to 14 days, the average being approximately six days at the start of the pandemic. That means that if you developed symptoms of COVID on day six of an admission, you had an essentially 50-50 chance of acquiring it in hospital mm. or in the community. And in that preceding six days, you may have moved several areas in, in, the, in the hospital. In the preceding 14 days, you may have had a number of different exposures in the community. So it's often very difficult to tie down exactly the point at which you would have acquired COVID. Right. By comparison, influenza, the average incubation period is about a day, uh, one to two days. So a much shorter space of time for us to look back and say, where was the patient? Who did they come into contact with? How do we investigate and manage this problem? Okay, well, that brings us on to, can I have on screen, please, uh, INQ 474282 underscore 103 and table two. I'd like to look at the way in which Public Health England uh, assigned the likelihood of an infection being in hospital against that background of the incubation period. Now, my lady, we touched on this briefly yesterday with Professor Hopkins and some of the data, and I skated through what the definitions were. But um, with your help, Dr. Warren, can you help us with HOHA, or hospital onset, definite healthcare associated? So these are patients that tested positive 15 days or more into their admission, so beyond the longest possible incubation period of the virus. So they acquired it in hospital. Yeah. Probable healthcare associated. So these are patients who tested positive between days 8 and 14 of their admission, where the balance of probability is that they acquired it in hospital, right. so not definite. And then indeterminate. Um, so this is where people tested positive from day 3 to 7 of admission, so where initially the balance of probability was that it was acquired in the community. Right. Community onset possible healthcare associated. Help us with the definition there. So these are pa patients who tested positive um, within two days of being admitted, but had recently been discharged from hospital. So very early in the pandemic, it became clear that um, a number of people were being readmitted to hospital, oh. having acquired their COVID on their prior admission, going into the community and coming back. Right. And this category is intended to capture those patients. Understood. And then community onset community acquired. So these are people who tested positive in the first two days of their admission but had not had any prior healthcare contact. So you've effectively got reasonable certainty at the top end and reasonable certainty at the bottom end of, bottom end of the table but slightly greyer areas depending on the day of testing in the middle. Understood. Now translating that to um, the data that there is in relation to COVID, um, can you just help with some advantages of those definitions and then some disadvantages or caveats to those definitions? So the advantage is that that kind of data can be collected at a national level at scale because there are national databases of hospital admissions and discharges and there are national databases of testing. If you put those two together, suddenly you have, a, you have data from all of the admissions in the country and you can use that to compare hospitals, regions, interventions over the course of the pandemic. So at a surveillance level, it's, it's helpful. The disadvantages are that it works less well on an individual level. If you wanted to know whether an individual caught COVID, you can't necessarily use it unless it's one in those extreme ends of community or hospital onset. Um, it's also limited by things like testing availability. If there is a delay in testing for any reason, um, then you may be put into the wrong category by mistake. And there are also limitations on, um, finally, the definition of indeterminate being seven days, as the pandemic progressed, the newer variants had a shorter incubation period. Right. So it went down from probably around six days at the start to about three and a half days with Omicron, which meant you would be miscategorising a lot of people as community acquired who actually were more likely to be hospital acquired. Understood. All right. Um, 
can I ask you this? These were categories used by Public Health England. Were there similar categories and definitions applied uh, across the UK? There were, indeed. There were some slight caveats. Um, the example is that in Scotland, I understand that they did not use the possible health care associated, okay. community onset possible health care associated, because they could not easily or readily identify preceding admissions in those patients. So there were some slight nuances, but overall, they were consistently used across the UK, to best of my knowledge. Um, with the definitions in mind, the caveats in mind, though, I think you, in the report, tried to estimate the number of hospital-acquired SARS-CoV-2 uh, infections. Can I ask you about your summary, please, at paragraph 11.17? Um, I think, essentially, having set out a number of different studies and the like, you said there are estimates of the proportion of COVID infections acquired in hospital range between 5 to 20 per cent of all COVID-19 cases identified in acute hospitals. Is that correct? It's quite a, a wide range there. Yeah. Yes. Um, but doing your best, did you come to the conclusion that overall it was highly likely that the true number of patients who contracted a hospital-acquired COVID infection in the UK was well over 100,000? Yes. And are you able to help us with sort of what was like the lowest estimate and what could be the highest estimate based on the modelling studies that you looked at? So the, the lowest proportion that's quoted in these studies, and this is a combination of big national data sets and smaller individual hospitals and everything in between, the lowest that's come to is 5%. Right. The highest is 20 But some modelling estimates are actually much higher than that because we don't take account, for example, of people who catch COVID but don't develop symptoms until they get into the community. So in some studies, it's even higher than that 20% figure. And when you say well over 100,000? Data from NHS England, which is included in, in the pack for this hearing, um, states that up in, in England alone, up until June 2021, there were 65,000 hospital-acquired infections, either falling into the, the first two categories, the definite or probable. Okay. Um, and that's only up until June 2021, and only in England. So I think that the both national data and the data from this, the estimates from this, converge on that figure of being well in excess of 100,000 people. And if we think about, I don't know if you heard uh, Professor Hopkins' evidence yesterday in relation to some Public Health England data that looked that, that found that between March 2020 and April 2021, for hospital onset definite uh, healthcare associated figures, they were nearly 30,000 of which 9,854, almost a third of those people died. Yes. Um, that's just to sort of try and bring the two strands together. You, in the report, with uh, that sort of headline figure in mind, looked at variation by patient population. It's at your paragraph 11.15, um, but help us with some of the variations that were noted across the patient populations. We um, were so, aware of age. Yes. Um, um, so age is an, an important factor that uh, they were more likely to have hospital-acquired infections. Um, the type of hospital it affected the proportion of healthcare-associated infections. So, for example, um, those in community hospitals accepting community cases of COVID had an overall lower proportion, whereas mental health trusts, community trusts, where patients are resident for longer, and you, they wouldn't generally admit community-acquired cases okay. by turn had a higher proportion. Um, but also patients of a higher number of comorbidities were also more likely to have hospital-associated infection. And in, uh, in that regard, you say that they were more likely, the proportions of patients with a Charlson index, I don't know what that is, could you help us? The Charlson index is a well-established term used in epidemiology. It's a simple scoring system where the more comorbidities you have, the higher your score. So, for example, you might get a certain number of points for cancer diagnosis or diabetes, and the more comorbidities you have, the higher your score. Right. So, if you old, more risk of contracting it in hospital, comorbid, at higher risk, understood, and depending on potentially where you were a patient, at higher risk. Yes. And we looked yesterday, and I don't need to look at it with you, but geographical variations existed, certainly in terms of uh, England. The outcomes of patients with healthcare-acquired COVID, um, I think you say it's challenging to work out the outcomes. Um, 
Can you help us with your summary at paragraph 11.26? Uh, yes. So the, the crude... So in terms of outcomes that we measure, mortality is the one that we can most readily measure, and it's the one that's been most widely reported. The mortality in people with hospital-acquired COVID at the start of the pandemic was very high, in excess of 40% in some weeks. Um, some studies that found that if you adjusted for other things that we know dispose you to severe COVID, like age, like comorbidities, actually that adjusts out to be the same as a community-acquired infection. Oh. It's just that our hospitals are full of people who are older, vulnerable, have comorbidities. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to work out uh, the outcomes, I think, for the reasons. What about, um, I think in your report, you included some data from Scotland. Are you able to summarise that for us and what you could tell us about uh, the outcomes? Yes, so um, we have... Uh, peer-reviewed studies published from England, Scotland and Wales which look at issues of hospital-associated infection. Um, so if we look at, um, so in, in paragraph 1121 here, that's where they quote that um, if you adjust for age and morbidity, actually the mortality in patients with hospital-associated COVID isn't necessarily different from community-acquired. Right. They also um, point out that um, with subsequent uh, uh, no, apologies, that's a separate study. Take a... I was just looking at the Scottish data. So, um, in figure 12 in this report... Yep. Um, this is the point I just wanted to make, that uh, the mortality, the number of patients that died of hospital-acquired infection, changed over the course of the pandemic. So, while it was very high with the original variant of the virus, with each subsequent new variant, Alpha, Delta, Omicron, the mortality for each of these different categories reduced. And can you help us with why that might be, or the reasons why? It's, it's probably a combination of things. Um, there's a, a significant drop in mortality associated with vaccination once the vaccines were rolled out. Um, there also appeared to be each subsequent variant, to an extent, was less virulent than the prior one, so less likely to cause severe disease. I think you said in the report that there was an RHI study uh, that found that inpatients who'd been vaccinated with either one, two, or three or four doses had lower odds of death within 28 days compared with those who had not been vaccinated. Yes. Understood. Um, I think those are dealing with outcomes of patients. Uh, can I ask you about infections of healthcare workers that were uh, in hospitals, please. Um, again, can we look at the summary of your conclusions and then perhaps work back and look at some of the examples? What were you able to ascertain in relation to uh, COVID infections acquired in hospital by healthcare workers? So the rates of infection, a number of studies have shown that the rates of infection in healthcare workers are higher uh, than the general population. Um, and that this is associated with higher rates of staff absence. Um, and that that is a combination of the direct infections with the virus, but also due to other issues, so exacerbations of mental health, a range of stress, burnout related to COVID-19. OK. Um, yeah. No, go on. Did you want to add something? Uh, not yet. <laughs> All right. Um, so, higher rates of infection in healthcare workers than in the general population. And I think there are various studies that you have set out. Uh, there was a particular study done, though, by the Nuffield Trust on staff absences. And I want to be clear about whether that deals with staff absences over the pandemic because of the pandemic, as in directly people got COVID or were a consequent stroke byproduct of the, the pandemic. Can you? Have a look, please, at your paragraph 11.29 and help us with what the Nuffield Trust found. So this is a report which looked at staff absences uh, in the UK um, pre, during the pandemic. Right. And they, sh they show data um, in figure 13 from 2014 up until mid-2022. And what they show is that pre-pandemic there were staff absences that peaked every winter, 
and that these um, were up between 4 and 5 per cent of staff um, at any one time, likely an underestimate because of underreporting. With each wave of the pandemic, the first and second wave, there was a, a spike in absences. Yeah. Likely they attribute to direct infection of the virus. But then with the event, advent of Omicron, that um, the rates were persistently increased. They didn't go back to their normal baseline. And the report gives a number of reasons for this, including the direct effect of COVID or COVID complications, chest infections, but also higher rates of mental health uh, problems, burnout, stress, um, and a range of other conditions, which are perhaps not directly related to the infections caused by COVID, but a lot of the side effects of the pandemic. So if I understand you correctly, is it possible to say then that where there is an absence, whether it's because the person's got sick from COVID or it's be do we know whether they have gone off sick because the stress they've burnt out? Can you draw that distinction from the data alone? Um, there are problems with the way that it's reported, etc. But if you look at paragraph uh, so E here, um, they suggest that as much of uh, the rates due to infection, cough, flu-like illnesses up increased from 27 to 27 percent compared to 10 percent in pre-pandemic times, but mental health increased 26 percent at the same time period. It's probably a combination of of different factors. I'm asked to ask you this, whether there is a link between the high rates of infection in healthcare workers and the failure to recognise airborne transmission of uh, COVID. Um, are you able to opine on that at all, or is it simply not possible to say? I think that it's a very... Do you, would you mind repeating the question? Yeah, it was... Uh, is there any link between the high rates of infection in healthcare workers and the failure to recognise airborne transmission of COVID prior to early 2022? I think it's a very complicated area to address. And later in the report, we addressed the various ways by which healthcare workers may become infected. Um, I don't, there are a number of different steps between this, the recognition that COVID may be airborne through to rates of healthcare worker absence. And I would, that, that path is quite complicated. So I don't think it's direct. Fine. Is there any um, data that would suggest there is a link between higher rates of COVID infections acquired in hospital for healthcare workers and a rise in community infections? The other way around is true, that if there are higher rates in the community, there are higher rates in healthcare workers. A acquiring it in hospital? Um, That's what I was trying to get at. It's my fault. No, I see. So... The, the data that uh, is included in the report and that I've read suggests that the chance of healthcare worker infections um, acquiring it in the community is higher at times of high community prevalence. Right. When community prevalence falls and you have persistent transmission in hospital, the chance of getting it in hospital is higher. All right. And the sources of transmission, please, in hospital. In your report, you separate individual factors from environmental factors. Can I ask you about... Firstly, individual factors. It's at your page 123. Um, obviously, there's a number of ways one can acquire the infection, but what are the individual factors, please? For patients or for healthcare workers? Uh, dealing with patients, firstly. So we know that the majority of patients who acquired in, uh, COVID in hospital were infected by other patients. One of the major issues is um, not recognising a, um, a patient who developed COVID while they were in hospital and spreading it before the diagnosis was made. We know that on arrival to the hospital, sometimes if there was limited isolation capacity in assessment areas, that people with COVID and without COVID would be cohorted together in the same space while they were awaiting test results to guide them towards either a COVID ward or a non-COVID ward. Um, we know that there are patients who did not present with typical symptoms of COVID, where a diagnosis was not considered. So, for example, particularly in elderly populations, they may present with atypical symptoms like diarrhoea um, or gastrointestinal symptoms rather than the classic fever, cough, breathlessness. Um, and we've alluded to it before, but the asymptomatic yeah. rates are incredibly important in patients, in staff, and potentially in visitors. Um, you separated uh, the individual factors between patients and healthcare workers. Is there anything you'd like to say about healthcare workers and the individual factors? 
Or is that more the environmental factors? Um, so the, the same applies to healthcare workers. The rates of asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic infection and potential for transmission. Um, um, there's a, a, a phenomenon that happened during the pandemic where people with perhaps mild symptoms who were able to come to work felt they were duty bound to do so, to try and not let down their, their teams, their colleagues, and because they felt compelled to do work for the pandemic, particularly people who had minimal symptoms or very mild symptoms of COVID. Is that, is that the phenomenon known as pre pre presenteeism? Presenteeism, as opposed to absenteeism. So trying to do the right thing, essentially, but actually bringing in, potentially... Potentially. ..the virus, understood. And then environmental factors? Um, anything that facilitates meeting of people in hospital where there are ineffective controls. So um, one of the major things um, is about ventilation and the age of the NHS estate. Um, so you're with uh, uh, poor ventilation so that COVID can potentially remain in in the air and the environment for prolonged periods of time. Um, many NHS hospitals have a limited amount of side room capacity, which makes isolation very challenging. We have a number of old fashioned uh, hospital wards where we have large open bays with large numbers of patients in them, which can again facilitate the transmission of the virus, as well as, I say, variation in IPC practices that we've already discussed and how well they're utilised. And we've um, Dr. Shin has mentioned earlier on that towards the end of the first wave of the pandemic, we got better at staff breakout areas and providing non-clinical areas and how they should be worked. I think that at the start of the pandemic, we were less effective at that. Okay. And that sometimes these particularly staff areas are less well ventilated, can be quite cramped. I was going to ask you about, is there any data or anything you can add about uh, what we know about transmission in non-clinical areas? Um, so we know that it happens. Uh, we know that... Um, this, is, so this is areas where we might have office space, for example, or um, breakout areas. It's very difficult to try and get that kind of information because we don't have the same level of data that we do about patient movement. Um, but we have identified clusters of, patient, of uh, kind of healthcare workers who don't work in clinical areas who have transmitted the virus between them, so it's certainly possible, as you would find in, in social settings in the community as well. I think you make the point in your report that there are certain occupational groups that had higher rates of... Um, healthcare workers infections, notably domestic services, staff, nurses and healthcare assistants. Can you help as to why there were certain groups of um, staff that had higher rates of healthcare acquired COVID? So some of them were exposed more to COVID-19 patients. So these are people who work in acute uh, specialties uh, in, front, in the emergency department, for example, in acute medicine who would receive COVID-19 patients. Um, there is an observation which has been replicated on multiple instances that higher rates were observed in healthcare workers from minority ethnicity, even accounting for the job role which they undertook. And there were rates that were higher in, as you mentioned, domestic services staff, nurses, pe uh, healthcare assistants, porters, people who had frequent direct contact with patients. Do you know if there was any data dealing with healthcare acquired infections for migrant workers? I'm not aware of anything that specifically differentiated migrant workers from other types of worker. And um, we've looked at patients, looked at healthcare workers. What about the role of visitors in transmitting the virus and adding to the burden of COVID being acquired in hospitals? So the level of data and quality studies we have on visitors is, is much, much, much lower than we have for patients right. and for healthcare workers. Partly because, as I mentioned, we have good data on who our patients are, where they are, when they get tested. The same was true with healthcare workers when we introduced staff screening. But we keep no records of who visits our, our patients. We don't know what happens to them after they leave the hospital. And therefore, it's very difficult to be able to understand the role that they have in, um, in transmission events. And clearly, if they, the visitors are asymptomatic, harder still to determine any data. Understood. Um, may I just deal with couple of discrete topics before returning to the recommendations that you all made at the beginning of your evidence. I, I, I'm asked to ask you whether you would, could particularise the precautions that should have been recommended for healthcare workers, for patients that are infected or suspected to be infected with COVID. I don't know who feels best qualified to answer that, but I think essentially we want to know what you would have recommended in the IPC guidance to protect those looking after 
infected or suspected infected patients. Is that with particular regard to PPE? Yes, I would have thought so. I think we've... We, um, and I imagine this particularly refers to FFP3 masks. Yeah. I think we've already said that I'm of the view that the balance of evidence as we have it now is that FFP respirators would provide more protection for healthcare workers than surgical masks. Um, in addition to the wide range of other measures that were taken in terms of PPE, um, isolation, I would point out, because it hasn't quite come up yet, is that although patient to healthcare worker transmission is important, um, in, there's also an enormous contribution of healthcare worker to healthcare worker transmission, where FFP3 masks would not, no, would not be recommended. And a lot, the majority of that actually happens in non-COVID clinical areas where FFP3 masks aren't routinely worn. Just thinking about that practically, is that healthcare to healthcare in a staff room or in a canteen? Is that the kind of thing that you're uh, speaking of? We don't know. Potentially in staff areas, potentially in you know, canteens, potentially in a car on the way to work, um, potentially in a clinical area where, you know, where PPE was, uh, was not used or not used to the same extent in the direct care of patients. It's, it's not clear where that happens. Um, but we know that from um, genomic epidemiology studies that people who work together on the same ward, um, healthcare workers can, trans or part of the same transmission network where the virus is transmitted among healthcare workers in that clinical area, or they can't specify exactly where on the ward that happened, or in outside, the, outside the ward setting. Can I return to the precautionary principle? I think to you, Dr. Shin, um, Clearly, it's an approach to trying to mitigate the risks of um, the virus. You spoke about HSID being an example of the precautionary principle in practice. But if you, by reference to your paragraphs 12.43 onwards, do you have any observations about the use of the principle or overuse of people demanding the precautionary principle? Help us, please, with your observations. I think in retrospect, you know, you know we, I think it's now clear that, well, in my mind, that the COVID is transmitted uh, through the airborne route. So with that in mind, I would agree with the earlier response that FFP3 would be my rec uh, what I would recommend. In terms of the precautionary principle, and I think, it's, I, mean, I think it is part of our recommendation that in a future pandemic, that we would suggest that before PPE steps down, you need evidence that that would be, is a safe uh, step to take rather than step down and as evidence mounts that you should have RPE, yes. then do that, do it that way, which is what happened in this case. Um, so I think if we were faced with a similar situation, which I hope we're not for a long time, then we would suggest that we can understand why there are loud voices calling for the precautionary principle uh, for PPE. And I think that would be more reassured. All of our, our workforce would be more reassured if that precautionary principle was applied in a future emergency so that we only step down PPE when the evidence showed that, that was reasonable and safe to do so. So where there is an absence of evidence about the route of transmission, start with the highest level of protection and as you work out the routes as the evidence emerges, then make a decision to step down if that's appropriate. Is I, that think it that is our, that's, I think that's probably our consensus view. All right. okay. um, Can I return to um, lessons learned, your conclusions and recommendations, please? I'd like to ask you about a few recommendations that you set out in your report before coming back to the ones that you um, spoke of this morning. I'm not going to go through them all, but can I ask about recommendation A? And you subdivided those into um, various categories, and it's recommendation A5. You say, we are aware of variations in PPE adherence across the NHS and even within NHS organisations. The best quality PPE will not help protect staff if they don't use it or don't use it properly. We recommend that in future pandemic or epidemic, IPC training is sufficient quality to inform healthcare workers of the threat posed. Uh, what PPE to use, why and when. Um, it may be your uh, remit, Professor Gould, but why 
Um, are you, how is that going to be sort of achieved is essentially what I wanted to ask. Could you repeat the first Yes, if you have a look, please, at your page 134. And recommendation A5. And if it's not you, one of the doctors I know will step in. But it, was my, uh, it wasn't my particular recommendation. Um, but if but we're trying to get staff to adhere to, to PPE, clearly training is a part of that. And would that go back to training at, from the get-go when people are trying to become nurses, yes. healthcare assistants? Pe people would like. need adequate training so that one could build on it later on when they come into practice. And what about those who are already practising? They would need updates. Yeah. And is they would need regular updates. And is there a sort of continuing professional development um, regime that could accommodate? There should be. And of course it has been renewed with the new recommendation, the new educational approaches to do with the um, launch of the national manuals. Um, a lot, I would suspect, probably still depends on the particular organisation where people work. The other thing is that with equipment that people don't use very often, they have to be refreshed very often how to use it because people reasonably, quite reasonably, forget. So they would have to have regular updates. We referred there to nurses and other members of clinical staff uh, having training. What about training for non-clinical staff? Is that realistic? How practical is that? It would depend. It would depend on the degree of. It would depend on what they did. Um, but if people are going to come into contact with patients, then they yes, they would require training. People who never see a patient, um, it would not be relevant to them. Um, what about outsourced workers? Could you give me an example? Uh, I'm, it's one of the questions I was asked to ask while I was on my feet. So no, but I imagine those that aren't trained within the NHS. Um, as I understand it, a number of workers within, uh, working in healthcare aren't employed by NHS trusts, but are outsourced oh. by agencies and the like. I'm just I, trying to think about the practicalities of yeah. training for that cohort of staff. I would think staff. people like agency nurses, many, many um, NHS organisations have um, what they call bank staff, which will be people who work on a, reg on a regular or reg irregular basis, but they draw on the same people. Those people should have training. Um, so I, many years ago, I was a bank nurse myself, and people did receive training before they were, they were able to join the scheme. Um, and in an ideal world, they would have updating. But it also needs to be pointed out that many people who do agency work and bank nurse work are employed full time elsewhere, and would be have, they will have a, a, you know, a regular job as well. So they would receive their updating there. Thank you. Um, there was a recommendation at D for a single source of official IPC guidance to be available throughout the UK. And I was uh, first question, I suppose, really is what, what, what is meant by a single source? Well, the principles of infection prevention are the same everywhere. Uh, the principles for breaking the chain of infection are the same everywhere. So it would be sensible to have one single source instead of dividing up efforts uh, and producing multiple sources. Given that health is devolved... <laughs> Though I, I suspect the question really is, is how is achievable is that, given that each nation is responsible for their own healthcare systems? Well, I think that people in those four nations do speak to one another. So I would think that that probably wouldn't be out of this world. I think it would, it, it would be achievable. Is it necessary, given that the NIPCM either is the manual or is the manual upon which the other guidelines are based, do you still think that it's necessary to have a single source of IPC guidance? I suppose I have a nice, tidy mind. So, um, but I mean, in, in fairness, uh, the, the manuals don't try and, and, and propose different principles. So I think that you would you, you would want a degree of um, commonality between all of them. It wouldn't do if they all look differently. And of course, people do move between nations that they work in. Um, your recommendation, E, Professor, I think may in part align with your recommendation for guidelines to win hearts and minds. You ask for education and training for all staff, and I think we've covered the reasons for that. But um, given everything we've discussed today, is there anything particular 
that you think would help win the hearts and minds and help the guidelines to be more closely followed and more bought into, for want of a better phrase? Education for people um, before they come into their professional roles in the universities is not particularly good. I know more about nursing because I am a nurse, but I did try very hard um, when writing the documents to find out about the other professional groups. Um, so I tried to find out what physiotherapists are taught, remembering that physiotherapists do a lot of respiratory interventions and would be in the firing line. And it was very hard indeed to find somebody who could tell me about the physiotherapy curriculum. And that was true of many of the other, um, many of the other professions. So it, it does worry me that we don't know or we can't easily get hold of what people are taught. Um, it would be, I think, an advance if people had a better basis for infection prevention in pre-registration training. I know that there's a lot of variations between universities and the number of hours that are put in. Thank you. Um, one of the other recommendations, uh, recommendation J, is that you recommend there should be a single UK-wide organisation or process with oversight of healthcare-associated infection. I don't know if this is your remit, Dr Vaughan, um, but um, what was envisaged by that recommendation? All of the... To be able to understand infection prevention and control, we need to understand the numbers, the surveillance, the numbers of hospital-acquired infections, the interventions which may be used to reduce them. It requires collation of a wide range of data sources, um, literature reviews we've already discussed as in a, in a rapidly moving field and decision makers and guidelines people who produce guidelines that needs a, a consistent unified process even if it's slightly different people different groups of people that do each of those things to ensure that that guidance is consistent um, and to the best quality that we can provide and finally you dr shin earlier this morning you advocated for uh, better understanding of ventilation in hospitals. Uh, we haven't touched on it, but we're aware of HEPA filters, UV lights, where it's not possible to tear down a roof and install new ventilation. Why is it that you have um, proposed, uh, as your headline recommendation, better research and better understanding of the role of ventilation? So it, it was ventilation and isolation. Uh, but in terms of ventilation, uh, this being a respiratory virus, that was obviously a, a very significant uh, risk factor for the NHS. Many hospitals are old and are not well suited to face such a, a threat like this. So in the future, it would be much better if we can, ideally long term, hospitals should have improved ventilation in general, as you, as you hinted, that we know that's difficult. So there are short term solutions, for example, uh, portable um, HEPA filtered uh, air filtration units are one possible short term measure. And as in Professor Baig's report, he talks about an, an ultraviolet, uh, high-mounted ultraviolet filtration system, which looks to me as a non-engineer like it might be something feasible to retrofit to some high-risk um, ward areas in hospitals. So I think risk mitigation measures should be looked at to make sure that our environments are safer. Um, but I don't want to lose sight of increased isolation capacity as part of the recommendation as well. Yeah. Um apart from building more hospitals, I was just trying to think about how practically uh, you could recommend that. You say we recommend the overall isolation capacity should be increased over the next five to ten years. Uh, apart from the rebuilding programme, how else might that be achieved? So we're trying to do something like this at the moment with limited resources. Uh, what we, what is, might be possible is for certain ward designs which have very open, open plan, open layout, which might be convenient for peacetime, but in a pandemic situation, that's a risk. So it, is, it could be possible to increase segmentation within the ward, uh, which is a kind of a halfway, halfway house uh, to full isolation, but it would probably reduce risk. So instead of having like three or four bays having a, you know, a, a domino effect of infections, you may be able to contain it, say, one bay rather than allow it to spread further. So I think we'd have to, I think we should look at all of our hospital estate and say, what can we reasonably do in a short space of time and also long term. Thank you very much. My lady, those are all the questions I have for the Thank experts. you very much. Um, I hope you all that we have another break in the afternoon, but I promise you the next session will be the last and you'll be gone uh, this evening. So I'll return at 10 past three. Thank you.
microphone. No. It was green. Is it now working? Yeah. Perfect. Good afternoon. I ask questions on behalf of the Trades Union Congress. I would like to address the infection risk associated with specific healthcare roles. In your report in Section 11 and in Dr Warne's evidence today, it has been explained that certain occupational groups had higher rates, most notably domestic services staff, nurses and healthcare assistants, and you also mentioned porters and certain therapist roles. Dr Warren has mentioned in evidence the influence of having more exposure to COVID-19 patients. And in your report in section 10, Professor Gold, as the lead author, explains that nurses and healthcare assistants provide most of the frontline care. It is here that the risk of spreading and contracting COVID is highest. My question, however, focuses specifically on domestic services staff and porters. Are you able to identify any aspects of the role or the working conditions of domestic service staff and porters which may contribute to the higher rates identified? I think it's for Dr Warren, but perhaps also Professor Gold. So I, I am not aware of any report that specifically addresses that, that exact question. But we know that the majority of healthcare worker affections that are attributed to patient transmission um, are on in non-COVID clinical areas. And what the, 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 uh, those staff members that you've mentioned have in common is that they move between clinical areas. So, for example, the role of a porter is to take patients between clinical areas. It's part, part of their role is to move between different clinical areas with patients. Um, so, um, and we know that staff that move between clinical areas from other studies are at higher risk of, of acquiring COVID. So that is potentially one route, but again, I have not seen any spe specific study that has addressed that. And I, I'm going to pass on to my colleagues, have you noticed or seen any? I've, ne I've never seen anything, I've never seen anything written about that. Um, I would agree with what has been said. Um, I can't think of any other logistical reason. These people are, are you know, they, they, they're per peripatetic, they go around the hospital. Um, they would also come into contact with visitors in, in, um, in general hospital areas, and that might have some contributory effect. Thank you. And just to perhaps drill down into what could be a potential other area, just to test it, um, if workers within a particular role have less access, for example, to training on IPC measures, to IPC guidance or to PPE, could that also be a feature of higher infection risk in a particular role? Uh, so perceived uh, lack of access to PPE and lack of training has been identified as a risk factor of healthcare worker infection in the first wave. Um, but that's based on uh, self-reporting of training and self-reporting of PPE access. So again, I'm not necessarily aware of any studies that have systematically looked at that. No, neither am I. Thank you. And, and, and building on some of the evidence today around the essential role of IPC leads and teams and the importance of clearly communicating guidance to workers, are there any additional challenges faced in reaching non-clinical staff who are not directly employed by the trust? So, for example, outsourced and agency cleaners and porters. Uh, Professor Gold has mentioned bank staff receiving training, but where the staff are not employed by the NHS, but by another company, such as a, a company providing cleaning staff, as, as far as you're aware, does that introduce additional challenges in ensuring they hear about updates to guidance or specific plans for approaching IPC within that hospital? It would be a complication, but most reputable cleaning companies would provide trained staff, so they would be trained as cleaners and they would be trained with infection risks. And to your knowledge, it, how good is... Apologies. Just to add to that, I think, I think it's a particular consideration with outsourced staff and the groups you've mentioned, and we have some of those. And the communication cascades which we talked about earlier today is a lot of it's by email and through 
and our email system at nhs.net. And whether staff not employed by our trust get those nhs.net emails, I'm not certain, and that could be, could be an area where the communication is not as efficient as we'd like, potentially. But I don't know for certain that's the case. But and I'm sure that we vary. That would vary a lot from hospital to hospital. And to your knowledge, is there sufficient oversight of the training and the guidance and these emails that are being provided? Could that be improved upon? So the emails I'm talking about are really highlighting to staff that there's a change to guidance, which is usually often put on our hospital intranet, which is accessible to our staff, meaning primarily NHS employed staff. Um, and the level of access to those online resources in our hospital for the outsourced staff I've mentioned, again, I'm not, I don't have enough knowledge today to answer that question now. So is it a fair summary that there may be additional challenges to getting messages and training to these staff and there might not be the right level of oversight as to what information and updates they're receiving? Uh, that is a possibility. I'm grateful, my lady. Those are my questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Peacock. Ms. Wirrer Atney. Uh, can you see? Yes. That way. Yeah. I have to look round the pillar. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I ask questions on behalf of Welsh breed families. Many members of this group experience loss of loved ones through nosocomial infection. Um, uh, my first question is on, on the precautionary principle, which I believe should be addressed to Dr. Shin. Uh, you considered that, and it, we were taken that to it by um, CTI at paragraph 12.42 of your report onwards. At 12.43, you say that the precautionary principle is an approach to risk mitigation in the face of potentially serious threats amid scientific uncertainty. And following on from that, you say at 12.45 that it is harder to apply the precautionary principle when the threat is on a massive scale uh, because it risks exhausting supplies of PPE for which the precautionary principle advocates. Now, I, I know you've made some recommendations which have also already been taken to in relation to uh, the de declassification of the pathogen uh, and um, HCIDs and commensurate levels of PPE. But I'm asking you about 12.45, leaving aside HCIDs, and more broadly. So my question is, do you agree that firstly, and put simply, assessing a risk or threat and uncertainty in scientific evidence and applying the precautionary principle, it, that is a different and prior process to the drafting of suitable IPC guidance to meet that risk. Would you agree? I think I agree with what you've said, yes. Uh, we, we've said in the previous session that we would, in a future pandemic, support the cautionary principle and only step down measures like PPE and other IPC measures when evidence there's evidence that that's safe to do so. But as we said, in, and you just highlighted that section of the report, if and when the, the risk we're trying to control is on a massive scale like in this pandemic and we face the uh, supply challenges that we discussed earlier today, then it may be impractical to do that, even though that's what is re recommended and what everyone intends yes. to do so. I'm so sorry, I've only got limited time, so I'm just going to jump back to my question. Uh, and that's really that, whilst there's a, a relationship between PPE supplies at some point and the risks that's assessed, but my question was that at the point of assessing the risk and the uncertain scientific evidence, that that uh, is a prior process to considering uh, suitable IPC guidance to meet the risks, including availability of PPE I'm not sure how you can separate the availability of the PPE if you, if you make guidance which cannot be implemented. And so, so that's the guidance, is I'm saying, a separate process to the risk assessment. Risk assessment comes first, and then you turn to guidance and availability of PPE. Yes. Would that be right? Two stages. That's a fair assessment. But then, but then we've also heard today that even when we've public, guidance has been published, they, they were often uh, you know, a caveat at the end saying, there can be local risk assessment, which may affect how this is uh, applied locally, for example. Yes, yeah, so th we're then looking at application of the principle. I, I'm t I, I'm, I was looking more at the actual risk assessment prior to the application or the implementation. Yeah. 
So there is a two-stage process. I think you have agreed with me, Do I think uh, Dr. Shin. I'm, I'm going I'm to move on. What you're saying, yes. Thank you so much. Because again, uh, what once once the pre precautionary principle applies, because there's a serious threat. Um, and I think you said there's a, f you described it earlier today as a facing a rising tide of a very dangerous lethal virus in early 2020, uh, and then the uncertain science, then you, then you look at what measures and steps are appropriate and available to guard against that risk that's identified. Slightly different way of putting the same point. I think we're agreeing. Yes, okay. So let me then uh, move on then. So if, you're, if you end up in a position where the precautionary principle clearly applies, but you require a level of protection through PPE that's known to be in short supply, uh, I think you'll agree, because I'm going to quote something that you've written, that policymakers have a responsibility to be transparent about decision making including whether logistical challenges or resource constraints have influenced their decisions. Is that right? Again, I think we're broadly agreeing here. Uh, Good. Well, I do quote that from your recommendation, actually, so I'm expecting, yes. I'm hoping that you agree. On that point, I think we, a point we're trying to make is that when we, guidance, et cetera, is produced, we've, we've argued for greater transparency in how that's arrived at and also who's involved in drawing up that guidance. So. Again, I think we're broadly speaking on the same page. Yes, that, I, I think that's right. But I, so I, I'm, I call it the honesty principle, which is I, I'm going to ask you, does it lead to less confusion and better understanding all round for practitioners and governments to have that kind of openness and transparency? Yes. Thank you. So um, I'm going to move on then to um, my next question, which is hopefully in time. A paragraph 9.27, which is Dr. Warren. Okay. Uh, in, in, in that paragraph, Dr. Warren uh, yes. applies to guidelines for the rollout of asymptomatic staff testing using lateral flow devices. Um, and that was published by the okay. NHS in November 2020, making twice weekly screening available. Uh, for all NHS staff in acute hospitals across the UK. You see that? Yes. Um, so, however, it appears that in Wales, asymptomatic staff testing was not in fact started until the middle of March 2021 and possibly not as late as July 2021 in some areas. Um, so the question is, uh, do you agree that this delay in implementation exposed patients to the risk of information, uh, infection from healthcare workers, and in asking that question, I, I, I bear in mind what you've said about the transfer of infection from healthcare workers to healthcare workers and patients to patients in your earlier evidence. So I think that would have increased the risk of transmission from healthcare workers, asymptomatic healthcare workers, to patients. The absolute increase in numbers may have been small in comparison to other routes of transmission but the, there is an increased risk. An increased risk. Thank you very much. And again to you, Dr. Warren, uh, on hospital-acquired infection rates, at paragraph 11.16.3 of your report, uh, you provide some statistics about hospital onset cases during the first wave um, in England, represented by 5.3% of all laboratory confirmed COVID cases. Are you with me? Yes. And uh, in Scotland, being 6.4% of all confirmed cases, uh, and in Wales, being 10.5% of all laboratory confirmed COVID-19 cases. Yes. And again, understanding that you've expressed some caution on that data in, your, in that paragraph, and noting what you say about the lower proportion in England, do you have any theory or hypothesis as to why, by this measure at least, the rates of hospital-acquired COVID-19 were so much higher in Wales? Um, so that may be a reflection of the studies, the way they were conducted, rather than a true reflection of the number of hospital-acquired infections in Wales. Um, that's why I'm reluctant to draw direct comparison between the three devolved nations in that regard because there are a number of different factors that may influence it. All right. So uh, are you able to consider what range of factors might affect the figure in Wales? Um, so, firstly, there, there, obviously it is potentially true that there is a, was a genuine, genuinely higher rate of hospital-acquired infection in Wales. 
and that may reflect, for example, the number of community-acquired infection rates across Wales, which were, I believe, lower in the first wave than they were in other parts of the UK. Therefore, the, the proportion of hospital-acquired infections would appear larger. It's difficult without having the full data, and there's it, probably a number of factors that could influence that. So again, I would draw, I, I would be very careful in drawing direct comparison between those three figures. Right. Thank you. My lady, I have one short question. So I have uh, one final question to Professor Gould in that case. Uh, and it's on training, um, Professor Gould. Um, so at paragraph 12.10 uh, of your report, you, you, you cover the need, uh, obviously, for PPE training to be of a good standard. Uh, our question is this. Do you have any specific recommendations for this to include in particular points on the changing scientific picture? to ensure buy-in to the guidance to promote staff compliance um, in that way? You'd have to have regular communication with the staff to tell them about the changes in scientific, um, in, in scientific thinking and regular continuing professional development. And there should be refresher updates. And there always have been refresher updates in infection prevention. I think in the past they perhaps haven't been as good as they might have been throughout all of the four nations. But I think there is greater awareness now. So I think in the future there will be greater awareness on CPD, continuing professional um, updating. And people will be more likely to buy into it because now they've had the experience of going through a pandemic. And they know that this is not just theoretical stuff that we expect people to know. It, it directly affects their well-being and that of patients. And just to be clear, that applies also to the changing scientific picture? Yes. Thank you very much. I have no Thank other you questions. very much. Ms. Gupta. That way. Is the mic? It, yes. Thank you. I represent the Frontline Migrant Health Workers Group, and our clients' members include outsourced workers within the NHS system, such as agency nurses, cleaners, porters, security guards, medical couriers and drivers that were not directly employed by the NHS. Dr Shin, we've been given permission to ask some specific questions about testing of healthcare workers rather than patients. Uh, you were referred earlier to paragraph 9.27 of the report, um, at and I'm going to take you back to that. In that paragraph, you state, guidelines for the rollout of asymptomatic staff testing using lateral flow devices were published by the NHS in November 2020, making twice weekly screening available to all NHS staff in acute hospitals across the UK. Just earlier in your oral evidence, you referred to NHS employed staff. The reference in that paragraph of your report to NHS staff is a reference to those employed by the NHS, isn't it? So that paragraph was written by me rather than Dr Shin, so perhaps if I may answer it, if that's OK. Yes, of course. Um, I'm not aware of the exact cr uh, eligib eligibility criteria for lateral flow testing that was rolled out as part of those recommendations. So I'm afraid I don't know if that applied to people working within NHS institutions who were employed outside of NHS employment. So you don't know whether it was extended to outsourced workers? I'm afraid I don't know. I'm grateful, thank you. During the relevant period of this module, March 2020 to June 2022, outsourced workers who were sick and unable to work because, for example, they were self-isolating were only entitled to statutory sick pay of £94.25 per week. Do you agree that this low level of statutory sick pay provided a disincentive to test because of the resulting loss of work if required to self-isolate? I'm sorry, which question is this that I've approved, Mr Sengupta? Um, it's in relation to the disincentive to test I, I've broken it down, m'lady, into two parts. The, the numbering has changed in terms of our spreadsheet, I'm afraid. Well, uh, can you answer the, could you answer the question, is, is there a possibility that if you, um, 
you may be financially affected if you test and are positive that you may not want to take the test. It's a disincentive. So, may Forget I... about the level of statutory sick pay, because that may not be for me. But... So we know that staff uptake when offered screening was not 100%. And we know that there are a variety of different reasons why people chose not to um, participate in screening programmes. I don't know, I don't have any expertise in the reasons for that, or indeed on um, the financial situation of people in the situation that you describe, and therefore I can't comment on whether that would have influenced their decision to participate in screening programmes or not. I don't know if you have any... I have some limited uh, experience of this, so I recall some discussions along these lines. The short answer to your question is that it could be a disincentive testing but my recollection of discussion, at least locally, was that that was recognised by the hospital leadership and NHS system leadership, and I think steps were taken to try and reduce that disincentive. The details of that I'm not certain of, but I, I recall that this area was recognised and discussed because, it, you know, staff took it, and we, it affects the hospital because we can't recruit, if we can't get staff to come on to work as agency staff, bank staff, for that reason, because they, they fear uh, in, uh, impact on the income, which is completely understandable. Steps, were, exact steps, were, I can't recall, but it was recognised and steps were taken to reduce that disincentive. But I can't give you further detail on that. Thank you. In terms of regular testing, do you agree that regular testing was a valuable IPC tool throughout the pandemic? Uh, uh, it wasn't available immediately at the start of the pandemic. Um, where it was available and when it was available, I think that it was a useful tool, IPC tool, um, and it became perhaps less useful as, for a variety of reasons, the later the pandemic went on. But I think that it is a very valuable tool. And if I, if I might, all people who, are, who work or visit hospital sites, they are potentially uh, capable of catching or transmitting COVID. So I think it's, it's critically important that all staff members who are there are treated should be treated in the same way with regards to testing um, and IPC measures wherever possible. Thank you. Um, Dr. Warren, at paragraph 9.25 of your report, you refer to the availability of testing in March and April 2020. Do you agree that in March and April, the limiting factors for testing were capacity and cost? It's more, it, there are more things to that. So while capacity and cost were certainly key features, there was also um, elements about technical expertise required, both to generate these testing platforms, but also to roll them out. They require special, um, uh, um, you need a, a supply of testing kits in addition to the testing capacity when you actually have the, the, the swab in your hand. Um, you also need the organisational structure by which to implement this. It's incredibly complicated. And finally, do you agree that as at March 2020, any suggestion that regular testing is of no value would be wholly incorrect. Um, Apologies, would you mind repeating the question? Not at all. Do you agree that as at March 2020, any suggestion that regular testing is of no value would be wholly incorrect? Um, I, I, yes. I think we need more information. We need more detail on that question. Regular testing of, of who and in what circumstances? Do you mean staff or patients asymptomatic? A outsourced workers. Outsourced workers. So we know that by early March 2020, COVID was prevalent in the UK and it was affecting wide varieties of people in the community in different groups at different levels across the different regions of the UK. I think that if we had the capacity that asymptomatic screening of healthcare workers working in hospital, if it was available, um, in retrospect, would have been useful, but I think there are so many different factors to consider when making that statement. I'm not sure I can wholly agree or disagree with that statement. Thank you. Thank you, lady. Thank you very much, Ms. Sengupta. Uh, right. Uh, Mr. Wagner, wearing the hat for the clinically vulnerable first, I think. Correct. Thank you. Um, good, good afternoon. Um, my name is Adam Wagner, and I act for clinically vulnerable families a group that represents people who are clinically vulnerable, clinically extremely vulnerable, and their families. Um, so my first question is for, I think, Dr. Shin. Um, I want to ask you about paragraph 4.51 of your report, please. 
um, and this is with reference, this is a part of the report where you're referring to aerosol generating procedures, and you say there, much less attention is paid to the risk posed by natural respiratory aerosols exhaled by patients, healthcare workers and visitors, despite the fact that these aerosols vastly outnumber those produced by AGPs, that's their aerosol generating procedures, and potentially pose a greater infection risk. The much higher risk of infection associated simply by occupying the same indoor space as that occupied by somebody who's infected suggested the routine use of RPE would have offered a higher degree of protection. Um, and, and, and Dr. Shin, am I asking the right expert the que a question about this section? So the, the quotation there is a direct reference to the report from Clive Beggs, who yes, gave evidence it's, it's inquiry a, last it, week. It, and I think it's agreeing with um, Professor Beggs. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, um, Dr. Shin or, or, or um, Dr. Warren, whoever wants to answer, answer the question, you, you said, Dr. Shin said in evidence, um, you were asked about FFP2 and FFP3 masks as compared to, to nothing, as compared to no measures. And you agreed, you said it was clearly true that the, a higher level of protection would be um, offered by those interventions. And just considering the risks of respiratory aerosols exhaled by patients and visitors, so members of the public, and the FFP2 and FFP3 masks, would it, in your view, have helped for there to have been clear public guidance about the benefits of FFP2 and or FFP3 masks, so that when the public entered healthcare settings, potentially with COVID or potentially at risk of COVID, they would be better educated on the benefits of those, of those masks and be able to make sort of informed choices about what they do. For, sorry, for members of the public? Yeah, members of so people visiting hospitals or patients. I'm not sure I fully understand the question because we, we're never going to offer visitors, if that's what we're talking about, FFP2 or 3, if yes, I may not be understanding the question correctly. So, so, so and, and I, I'm, I was going to come on to that in a moment, but in relation to, I, I think it was Dr. Warren who just said, in response to the earlier question, um, that members of the public bring brought COVID into hospital settings quite often, um, logically. So, if a member of the public's coming to the hospital, um, and I and I'll extend the question in this way, if they brought their own FFP2 or FFP3 mask, and they wanted to wear it, leaving aside mandating, just they, it was their choice to wear it, would you agree that that should be facilitated because it helps protect them and the people around them? So there is clear evidence that wearing face coverings reduces the risk of transmission, um, and there is evidence that uh, FFP2 and 3 masks provide more uh, more protection in that regard, predominantly from the wearer coughing at, you know, um, really transmitting virus in that way. I'm not sure at a, a community level what the evidence would be, whether we can comment on that, bear in mind that these would be non-fit tested um, FFP2 and FFP3 masks and the variety of other considerations for community settings. But certainly the, the, there is clear benefit of wearing face masks when visiting hospital. Yeah. Um, and, and, but I think you've, all, you've also said that FFP2 and 3 are better, Le you know, obviously including fit testing and making sure you're wearing them in the right way. So if a person turns up, the member of the public, with one of those better masks, says, I want to wear it, is there any reason why you wouldn't allow them to wear it or give them, for example, a surgical mask instead? So speaking of my own hospital, we didn't, I'm not aware that we would have asked a visitor to change from FP23, should they be wearing one, to an FRSM. Um, and I'm not aware of any hospital which would have taken that position, um, if that's what you're buying your question. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the evidence of some of the clinically vulnerable family group that that's exactly what happened. Okay. They came into hospital and were told, no, no, you've got to wear the sort of hospital-issued surgical um, mask rather than the, the mask that, you're, that you've come in with. Um, and, and, and just following on from that, you know, this, talking about a clinically vulnerable group, so people who are who know that they are immunosuppressed or whatever the reason they would be particularly vulnerable to COVID, would you agree that it's 
would be important to al allow them or facilitate them to wear better quality masks if visiting a healthcare setting when potentially there's a high risk of, of COVID transmitting to them? I think answering the question today, I'd say, I'd say yes, it's reasonable that they continue to wear that mask. Now, what our position would have been in 2020 is a different story. One thing I do recall is that we asked uh, visitors to wear, if they were bride with an FRSM, for example, to put on a new FRSM because we don't know how long that, you know, could that mask have been contaminated. But I, I'll confess, I'm not, I've never come across even a report of a visitor arriving with FFP2 or 3 or being asked about that. Not that I get asked about every single incident at our front door. Um, but I think the base of your question, I think, is it's reasonable that if you've got a vulnerable visitor coming, for them to wear an FFP2 or 3 is a reasonable thing, and I can't think there's a good reason to stop them doing that. I would add to that, I think we also need to consider safer ways of vulnerable patients and health workers entering the hospital environment through a range of other measures, yeah. um, of which you know, PPE potentially is, is one of them. Yeah. Again, it's a poorly studied area, and one I think that's been highlighted by the pandemic that we need to take more of a, uh, uh, an interest in. Yeah. Are there any measures that you could recommend that might, you know, simple measures that might help those clinically vulnerable people coming to healthcare settings? So there are so two examples that spring to mind. One of them is dialysis patients and the other are heme oncology patients. So patients who need to access health services for life-saving treatment. Um, and various mechanisms were used during the pandemic to try and provide those hospital uh, attendances in as safe a way as possible through, for example, staggered appointment times, greater social distancing in, uh, in waiting rooms, use, guiding patients directly into uh, so, uh, clinic rooms rather than being in open waiting areas, etc. And we should be looking at restarting that package of measures in the event of a further pandemic as soon as possible for our vulnerable patients. And what about the um, healthcare staff wearing respirator masks when they're dealing with those immunosuppressed or clinically vulnerable patients? Would that be another way you might think you could reduce the risk of them, obtain, them getting COVID-19 or some other respiratory virus? So potentially the evidence base in this is, is, is much less clear, particularly for the use of valved FFP3 masks, where when you exhale, oh, yeah. you're potentially releasing um, material out. So I don't, I'm not aware of any studies that have looked at that particular risk. In the event that a patient is wearing an FFP3 mask, non-fit tested, and a staff member is doing the same, what is the risk to those patients, to those individuals? In, theoretically, obviously, it would be lower, but I don't know, I can't quantify that risk in comparison to other measures we might take. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you, <coughs> secondly, about testing. And I think this is for Dr. Warren. You, you've spoken about um, lateral flow testing and about um, um, other kinds of testing. Is it a, is it a one-stop shop, or do you think repeat testing, testing after admission of a patient might help um, mitigate that risk of um, you know, long, long in incubation of the, of the virus? So we know that more frequent testing is more likely to pick up asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic cases. Yeah. Um, so the more frequently you do it, theoretically, the less likely you are to, uh, to, tra to yeah, the more likely you are to identify those patients early and to prevent them from transmitting up to a certain point. Yeah. The practicalities become one of logistics about how frequently you can test people. And certainly in our hospital, we were doing it more than just on admission. We were doing it at intervals during the course of their admission as well in an attempt to try and mitigate that. And do you think looking back, repeat testing after admission could have been used more effectively across the NHS to reduce transmission or um, one way or the other? It, it's difficult to assess, but because it, it, in doing that, you immediately reduce your testing capacity or screening capacity for other purposes. Yeah. This is a finite resource that needs to be managed in, in the best way possible. This is where some modelling interventions have been able to, you know, to fi try and find that sweet spot where you can provide the most benefit to the greatest number of patients and healthcare workers. It's not a straightforward question. Can I just add to that? In fact, in reality, in, in my hospital, which has a large number of vulnerable patients, we did actually have weekly PCR testing for a long period. Um, and in fact, even to this day, in our haematology oncology population, the most vulnerable, we maintain one, we once weekly surveillance PCR testing uh, in our inpatients. Thank you. Just one final question. In relation to false negatives, um, is there any evidence of common causal factors that might lead to false negatives? And is there anything that could be done, if there is evidence of that kind, to 
make the, to reduce the number of false negatives or false positives? So it depends on the testing platform that's being used. So there is, for example, evidence that if you don't get enough sample when you do the nasal swab, if you don't put it in far enough or enough material on it, that, you, that can lead to false negatives. So that's an issue about training or educating people how to use those tests. Um, then there are the intrinsic um, features of the test itself. Some of them have better sensitivity, fewer false negatives than others. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Uh, Mr. Simlett. My lady, the, uh, the questions you approved on behalf of the COVID Airborne Transmission Alliance have already been answered in the course of this afternoon, so I'm not going to ask those questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Simlett. Very grateful. You're back up, Mr. Wagner. A bit, a bit, a bit of a gap. Um, <laughs> I have to open my computer again. Um, I, I'm also acting for a, a different core participant, um, the Pregnancy, Baby and Parenting Organisations, which is a coalition of 13 charities um, that deal with those kinds of issues. Um, so I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions, please, um, on, on their behalf. Um, so... First of all, I think this is a question for Dr. Shin. It's about visit visitors' guidance. Um, Dr. Shin, do you agree as a general proposition that it's much harder to strike a reasonable balance with visiting restrictions during a pandemic if there isn't clear national guidance to help achieve that balance? Yes. And, and following the same logic, would you agree that without clear national guidance, it would be much harder for trust, trust to strike a reasonable balance in relation to maternity and neonatal services? Yes, that's your answer, yes. And I'd like to ask you about paragraph 8.22 of your report, please, um, where you say, overall taking into account the exceptions made for special circumstances like end-of-life care, maternity services, patients with cognitive impairment, um, et cetera, and the fact that visiting guidance evolved to be more flexible over time, we believe a reasonable balance was struck, but with variation in local practice that cont contributed to different, differing experiences. Experience. Um, just a point of clarification, when you say maternity services, did you include early pregnancy services or were you focusing on, on childbirth itself? From my perspective, we were, we were focusing more on the child around childbirth. Yep. Um, so, w would it be right to say that when you were reaching that conclusion that a reasonable balance was struck, you weren't considering early pregnancy services, so such as attending early pregnancy scans with a partner? Uh, from again, from my perspective, when we were writing that, I was really focusing on the childbirth phase of pregnancy. And, and were you including in that neonatal services? You did mention it before. We mentioned it separately. I think, oh, oh, sorry, we didn't mention, I thought it was explicit that for neonatal intensive care units, it was quite common to have a, a more flexible approach. And I think we said that, you know, for example, parents, uh, many hospitals have accommodation even for parents to stay overnight yeah. so they could stay with, near or with their babies. So, so the national guidance for maternity and neonatal services wasn't issued until December 2020, so that's nine months after March 2020. Do you agree that in, in the interim there was a vacuum in relation to, to that area of, of, of the hospital services? I'll, my recollection is that I didn't, I, this wasn't the focus of all my workload in, that, in the pandemic period, so I can't answer that specifically for my hospital. Um, what I do know is that neonatologists around the country work in net, large networks and regional networks and nas national. So I am guess I would assume there's a lot of communication about this very point, but I wasn't privy to those. But, but w would you agree that, going back to my initial question, the fact there wasn't national guidance until December 2020 um, would have left individual trusts probably quite inconsistently applying what they thought was the best, best option? Yes, potentially, uh, but as, as I mentioned, uh, neonatology units work in networks, so I think there would have been uh, very quick, hopefully, very, I presume, very quick uh, arrival at some reasonable consensus about this, because I'm aware that they do work very closely together as networks. 
Sure, but, but that's not something you actually studied for the, you didn't take evidence on that for the purpose of this report. And it's not something I had, I had any direct experience of. No. no. Um, so just sticking on visiting guidance, I'm just looking at 8.14 of your report, where you say the extent and consistency with which these restrictions were and should be put in place across different clinical areas is unclear. We assume that most, if not all, NHS hospitals followed relevant national NHS visiting guidance in the four nations. Um, on, on what basis did you make that assumption? What, what was the evidential basis of assuming that um, most, if not all, NHS hospitals followed the, the, the relevant national guidance? I think I'd bring you to the early pre preamble of the report where we say we, we have, you know, we can talk about our own experience and also in our regions, perhaps, but we can't you know, really answer for the entire the experience of people across the entire country. And also, if we've, we look for evidence and couldn't find it, then we, we couldn't include that. So that was, that was, we were applying a precautionary principle, in a way, to that paragraph that, as far as, I, to the best of our knowledge, um, that was the case. But we can't speak for every trust uh, in the country and also devolved administration. As we said before, yeah. we have, don't have strong links, for example, with Northern Ireland. In some cases, we said in the report, in some aspects of the report, we could, it was hard to find evidence pertaining to other parts of the country. So would, that was the reason why, for the wording yeah. of that. Wouldn't the precautionary principle have, have meant you applied it the other way, that without yeah. evidence of, of there being a sort of majority who applied national guidance, you just couldn't say anything about it? Yes, it was, it, it was linked to the fact we can't always cover all aspects of the pandemic response in all parts of the country. Yeah, and, and there is evidence, this is the final point I want to make, there is evidence from the, the 13 organisations that I represent and their stakeholders that there was very inconsistent application of principles, if you put it like that, before that December 2020 national guidance. Is that, is that something that you can speak to or, just, or, 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 or not? Well, I'm not aware of that evidence no. that you've mentioned. Um, don't have anyone. No, I, I think it's important that we start, as I said earlier in the hearing, I think that it's important that we start to think more about visiting as an understudied area and one that always takes third place to patient and healthcare worker care, but one that we should consider further in future pandemics. Yeah. I'm not sure how best to do that, but I think that the reports produced by the organisations you represent are probably a good way of starting that process now. Yeah, and, 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 you, and I think it was you, Dr Warren, who mentioned earlier the you were talking about carers um, being a sort of special category of visitors where they're providing care to the individual. It may have been Dr Shin, actually. But w would you put, um, in, in relation to neonatal care or maternity services, the parents of the child, of the baby, in, in a similar category as, as carers rather than just sort of visitors? So I, I think that there are a number of different visiting um, groups of visitors that you could include. You have to consider, and it's important to consider them, yeah. including carers. And whether I would include them as in, in the caring group or not is, is a bit unclear because you know, some people might say that they fit more into the, the, the role of parents or you know, paediatric considerations. Um, you have to take, be a little, I'm a little bit cautious particularly around maternity services because we know that there are some pandemics that have happened in the recent past where pregnant women and people in the immediate postpartum period are at increased risk of severe disease. So swine flu, for example, I clearly remember looking after pregnant women who were otherwise fit and well on intensive care with a disease that was widely considered to be relatively mild. So we have to take each pandemic on its own merits. And I think that we should take these considerations now, but we need to be careful how we apply them in any future pandemic. Yeah, but, but you Thank would, you, Mr. Yeah, Wagner. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mitchell. I appear as instructed by Amar Anwar and Company on behalf of the Scottish COVID Bereaved. I think my questions are probably most suited to Professor Gould, but if I'm not right in that, please do intervene. My first question is in relation to the practicalities of IPC, particularly as it relates to visitors. Um, in your report, you identify that there are practicalities which have to be overcome. For example, patients taking off masks because they need to eat. One of the practical examples that was given to us repeatedly um, by the Scottish COVID bereaved was examples of seeing visitors and perhaps people from various different wards coming out of the hospital 
to smoke or to get some air or both, mixing with one another and then going back separately to the wards. Do you agree when we go forward and look at IPC in the future that uh, any guidance needs to emphasise the movement of people not only within the hospital but from within the hospital to outside and back again? I think that it would be a very reasonable area to, um, to look at and to consider, but I don't have any hard figures about what was... You know, it, it's not something I've seen written about very much. I'm aware very much that in many hospitals in many European countries, patients spend more time outside of the hospital than they do in it if they're mobile, and it apparently makes no difference on infection rates. Well, that's very but, but but that but that's not in relation to COVID. That is in re relation to healthcare associated infection more generally. But I think it's an important and interesting point that you bring, and I think that it it probably should be given consideration in future guidelines. And moving on. Um, the evidence of Dr Warren earlier on said that you've no records who visits patients so, and what you've already said in relation to visitors perhaps um, already answers this uh, next question. But was there any work done to ascertain if visitors were adhering to IPC guidelines when they were visiting? Not that I'm aware of, no. It wasn't an area, again, that received a great deal of attention. The, the reason I ask that is the implementation and the differences between implementation of IPC visiting guidelines were noticed by the Scottish COVID bereaved and they considered that there was significant differences in between different hospitals, even in between different wards, as to how those policies and procedures were um, implemented. And as a result of that, it, it has caused significant upset and um, significant concern to the Scottish COVID bereaved. For example, a number of end of life visits weren't permitted during 2020. Um, there was an inconsistency in approach of things like how many people could visit, how, how, for how long and what setting, what protection they can wear. First of all, my question is, do you accept that there was a wide variation in the implementation of IPC guidance? Certainly, that there were um, variations reported among healthcare staff, but I'm not aware of anything written very much about visitors. That may be my ignorance, but I have not read very much about that. Again, would that point to um, an area of IPC, uh, IPC that should be considered more? I think it, it, it would be a good idea to consider it more in the future. Yes, thank you. And and um, finally, and sort of moving on from, from the point that you've just made there, um, I was so interested to hear about your hearts and minds argument to engage people in these sorts of policies. Would having um, one set of guidelines that we could say to people, these are being implemented consistently and uniformly, be a good idea to, to ensure compliance, to to make people think I'm doing this and other people are doing the same thing. We could never ensure compliance because we don't live in that kind of a world. But if people know why they're doing something and agree with it, I think you will be more likely to have their hearts and minds, yes. I'm obliged, my lady. Those are our questions. Thank you very much, Ms Mitchell. I think that completes the questions that people wanted to ask. I'm really grateful to you. I don't know if it's easier sharing the burden after a long day of intensive questioning or whether it's harder, I don't know. Um, but thank you all very much indeed for all your help in preparing the report and for all your help today. I'm very grateful to you. Um, right, it's 10.30 on Monday. It is. Or whatever of December it is. Yes, 23rd. Thank you. Thank you, my lady.